Hello, I'm Penelope Perkins Veazey. I'm a professor at North Carolina State University, and I am based at the Plants for Human Health Institute in Kannapolis, North Carolina. Today I'm going to be talking about post-harvest for fresh and direct markets for muscadine grapes. Hmm. Now muscadine is the most important thing is to remember. Muscadines differ quite a bit from bunch grapes. So unlike a bunch grape, which is a very long, full, tight cluster, Muscadines are very loosely clustered and, and basically have no more than 10 usually, and many times are cingulated. They might have one or two spaced along a vine. Uh, and then according, along with that, they also tend to be at the top of a trellis rather than hanging down from the trellis. Also, muscadines are usually slip skin and seeded. There are seedless varieties available now, uh, but the primary ones that are, are used for fresh market remain to be are seeded. One of the things that they have in common with table grapes is the soluble solids of bricks are similar between 13 and 24 percent sugars. Also in a muscadine grape, because you do have removal from the stem, a stem scar becomes a source of tearing, also juice leakage and decay. And like table grapes, muscadines need refrigeration. Unlike table grapes, they have a short shelf life, which is can be measured in weeks, not months. Part of this is because table grapes often are uh, used in the past at least sulfur dioxide was used which muscadines seem not to be able to tolerate. Um, so basically when you end up with um, you start with the muscadine here with the stem scar uh, if you have inappropriate refrigeration or other issues you end up with this little pile of mold after several weeks. One of the little plugs I'm going to add and other speaker will be discussing this in more detail Sanitation and food safety. Make sure that you follow everything from the time you think about where you're going to put your grapes, you know, what type of nut, make sure it's not a sewage field, for instance, um, all the way through the time you put them on the truck because you ultimately have responsibilities that can be traced back to you if something goes wrong in the market system and someone gets ill. Fresh market and direct sales and quick contrast, um, direct sales being primarily either on the farm or a U-PIC system, and sometimes those, these two are combined. Um, the key points for both types of sales is to know what variety to plant. So uh, I'm going to start with the bottom one here. Uh, there are a lot of great varieties that are recommended for fresh market. They're larger usually. They tend to be less or firmer than the ones that are juice grapes, such as Carlos and Noble. Um, you will be very disappointed. Fresh market will get rejected a lot if you're trying to move Carlos and Noble as a fresh market grape because they just leak really easily. They're very prolific grapes, but they leak and they're not firm. Um, the other thing to remember about this, um, the dry stem scar helps with storage life and keeping the juice off the grape for either market. Um, specifically for direct sales, encourage your consumers to wash the grapes before they eat them. You don't have to wash grapes if you're doing this for fresh market. In fact, there are reasons you might not even want to do it uh, that somebody else will be going into. Uh, but definitely encourage your customers to wash their grapes. Here's some common fresh market varieties uh, that have been around. Remember, these are large grapes. Compared to a table grape, these are probably three times bigger than an individual table grape. So they, they run anywhere between something like um, I see Nesbitt is on the smaller side, so between 8 grams all the way to 20 grams in size. So pretty large. And these also range in different colors, and they have they come in what's called bronze types, which as you can see here, anywhere from a greenish color, greenish gold, to um, almost a brownish color. And then also purple. There are fewer varieties of that for fresh market. And then the red, which are fairly unusual in the market. There's various reasons for that. but um, there's only two varieties, Scarlet and Ruby Crisp. Now, the thing to remember about bronze grapes in particular, uh, sometimes consumers think the more green grapes like Granny Val or Sour. And the, on the other hand, if you happen to have a lot of the brown, now this one's okay, um, but as they age, sometimes they get to this really kind of uh, very brown brown, shall I say, um, that can be viewed as being overripe. And sometimes they are, it's, they can be soft. Uh, when it comes to the purple grapes, what is really important here. So Polk and Lane are newer varieties. Um, they're also earlier, which is nice. Um, Lane has a problem sometimes with the stem end turning fully purple. And it's not as bad. Supreme really has this problem, even though Supreme is huge. Um, Polk tends to have full color on it, which makes it a, a very attractive alternative. 
for the purple gray people. Uh, Nesbitt, like I said, has been around a long time. It's one of the few dual muscadines that can be used for both processing and fresh market. So you have a lot of materials to choose from. And then there are seedless muscadines now. There is a couple available that are that are named. One is called Omai, it's a bronze type, and the other is a red type called Rasmataz. Very tiny. Um, and as you can see here, uh, Omai also is this way too, but these are picked kind of like a bunch grape. They, they tend to hang together in clusters. They're not as big as a table grape or vinifera cluster, um, but they tend to be easier to pick this way, of course, especially these little tiny ones, rather than singulating them. Uh, and that makes a difference because now your stem scars may be less frequent. However, these raguses here can dry just like in a table grape. Um, so that can lead to some new issues that you may be facing. So for fresh market sales, it's, it's incredibly important to remember that you only will have hand harvest labor. Labor. You cannot use machine harvesting yet on muscadines without bruising them and softening them. And also, because so many of these are available, they start to ripen in mid-August in North Carolina, go all the way to the end of October. So in those really hot days in August and September, you're going to have to pick early to reduce your field heat. You want to reduce your field heat so you don't have to take it out of the grapes later. The more heat you build up, the more refrigeration it takes to remove it. And this is key because for muscadines to last the longest, they have to be stored cold. The closer to zero degrees C or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the better. And I think the really important thing to remember here, storage life um, can be very dependent on that. If you don't get your field heat removed, you're looking at a very short storage life compared to if you can get them cold quickly and keep them cold. Um, the other thing to remember is that packaging is usually in vintage clamshells. These days, um, sometimes they are sold in different forms, but majority, especially for any kind of grocery sales, are usually in a one a one pound box. And again, the, the soluble solid should be 13 to 18 percent. Usually 13 is the minimum for market and as you get closer to 20 to 24 percent they tend to be, in my experience, they tend to be closer to overripe. So the key things to remember is you want that full color. Unlike some things like, like um, you'll get maybe strawberries that will continue to color after harvest, Muscadines don't do it quite the way you would want them to, like purple grapes don't get more purple. And if you have underripe grapes like this green one here, that's not going to turn into this. Um, what you are going to see though is that when you have grapes that are this, which is kind of ideal redness here by the color, what you'll see over time is that sometimes they will get more brown, uh, which is not attractive. And they kind of lose their gloss over time too. You know, they'll start out with kind of a sheen on them and they start to lose that sheen as, as they dry out. The other thing to remember is that sweetness does not accumulate after harvest. If it comes in as a 13% bricks, it's not going to go to 20%. The good news is that ethylene production is very low. You don't have to worry so much about it, it either giving off ethylene or being sensitive to ethylene. Probably you're going to have some sensitivities because botrytis, its major pr uh, problem with pathogens, does tend to respond to ethylene and it, um, it tends to sporulate, uh, cause the, the fungi to sporulate. Uh, but overall, that ethylene maintenance is not a big issue with muscadine. And this is, by the way, is a refractometer. It's a digital refractometer if you want to be checking your, your sugar content in your grapes. Okay. So for you pick sales, it's really about getting the customer what they need at minimal expense to yourself uh, and making sure it's sanitary. So, and also in good shape. So what you don't want is five pound buckets of muscadines because they'll pack down and cause juice. Um, best, the best one I think is these little buckets are in like, they come to them a one pound to three pound size uh, with a weigh as probably three pounds of muscadines in there and that's plenty. And you put a liner in here, a plastic bag liner. And then when the customer checks out, you simply weigh that liner with the fruit in it and hand it to the customer. You keep the bucket and reuse it, sanitize it and reuse it. If you want something a little different, there's a one gallon box with a handle that's also available. This might give it maybe a little bit easier for some customers to pick up and move. And then the other thing, the really important thing I think to remember with UPIC is to make sure your customers are trained. Make sure that they're aware of what the right color and ripeness is supposed to be, especially if they have kids. The last thing that they want and you want is to have a half a bucket full of greener underripe grapes. They're not going to enjoy them. 
and you just watch more profits go down the drain because those grapes aren't fully ready yet uh, and they haven't achieved full weight. So make sure that you spend a few minutes to try and educate your clients if they're not familiar with muscadine. Also, it's important to have refrigeration available because many times events happen. Maybe somebody wants pre-picked stuff or hadn't been something you planned to do, but maybe you had a rain event, you need to get your fruit out, you need a place to put it. Um, and it's amazing how many people will buy an extra bucket after they picked what they want. They'll buy an extra bucket that's in the refrigerator. And then the other thing too to remember for you pick, large size varieties are usually the most popular. It doesn't seem to matter what the fruit is. Usually people want it bigger. You know, and it's anywhere from pumpkins to pumpkins to grapes. It doesn't seem to matter. Okay, here's some examples of what happens. What what would be considered unmarketable berries? Um, shrivel is what happens. You, it's pretty clear. You get wrinkling of these berries. Very unattractive. They tend to lose their shine. Uh, they can happen with overripe grapes or ones that have been subjected to an awful lot of weight loss, maybe poor quality control of temperature or something like that. Um, decay is the number one issue in muscadines. This is Botrytis cinerea. It's gray mold, um, and it's the number one problem for post-harvest storage fungi uh, for grapes as well as many other fruits. And it, it tends to like temperatures above 41 degrees Fahrenheit. That's why it's so important to store your muscadines cold to stop the growth. Um, leaky fruit can happen. Sometimes this is a result of decay starting in, or sometimes the stem star tear started, um, and sometimes just age. Uh, the stem scar tears here are here. And what happens, these were stored a long time, like six weeks. Um, and what was happening here, which was kind of unusual, certain varieties have this very obnoxious browning ability around their stem and it's not disease um, but it's like they just have this ability to brown because there's, a, there's an injury place here and for whatever reason they, they go to town to put in anti-browning agent or to fight off that, that tear with anti-browning or browning agents themselves uh, so it can be quite unattractive. This usually only shows up though after four weeks of storage and like I said only in certain varieties and then splits happen we're not quite sure why. This could be a problems with a, a, a disease that came out of the field that weakened the flesh. Um, I usually, again, I see this only after five weeks of storage, and so not, and I don't always see it. And sometimes it seems to be specific to a cultivar, and then I don't see it the next year. So I'm not entirely sure what happens, but this does happen sometimes. It's the trigger pressure thing too, probably. It's like a weak spot develops in the grape, and then for whatever reason, it it just the, the skin gives way. And then browning, I talked about this a little bit earlier, you start mostly browns grapes, and you start with a nice bronze grape, and then it slowly darkens over time um, to this pretty unattractive mahogany color. Usually by then it looks also looks dried out. It doesn't have that shine anymore. So, and this, I'm not really sure what's causing it. It's not anthocyanins, I do know that. Uh, it just seems to be a gradual hue change, and again, it's a problem for appearance. If you're looking for grading standards, specifically if you're marketing to retail operations, USDA extra number one and number, and, uh, number one, uh, these are the criteria that are looked for. And here's kind of some examples of what this, this would be. Okay, other than the leaves being present here, or maybe the stems, this would be like what I would call an ideal USDA extra number one. They've got nice, shiny, firm fruit. They're very pretty uniform for the most part, don't have injury or decay, uh, well colored, look to be mature. This would be an example of an immature grape, uh, <clears throat> not wet from juice, not crushed, not leaking. And um, I would say you wouldn't have a problem meeting that soluble solids requirement of 13%. Up here, you know, here's your ideal. This I think was um, Summit. And here's what happens when Summit's fresh out of the field. You see a little bit of variation in the ripeness, but uh, you're not going to be graded against this level of, of color difference because that's expected in a bronze muscadine. This is what you don't want to see in your pack. This is not what you should be trying to sell. Um, these are uh, way over mature and have decay in the middle now. And also I think brought in some, probably some ripe rot or, or bitter rot from the field. Um, so this is a good example of what you should not do. Uh, the other the important thing is looking at your storage. Uh, there's only two ways that are recommended to remove field heat from muscadines. One is to use uh, room cooling and the other is to use forced air cooling. 
And usually the way this works is you want forced air cooling first because it's a rapid system that uses a, a, a high pressure fan system, a forced air fan system, um, to immediately move the warm air from the grapes. And then you can move those grapes to a low temperature storage room. And the important thing is, of course, is you want to reduce your mold, your shrivel, your weight loss, uh, most importantly, your mold, and get the longest shelf life possible. Uh, if you do not have this, though, if you don't have the capacity for air for a room cooling or forced air cooling, remember, um, plan accordingly. You can hold your grapes near freezing for 20 days, but at room temperature, that's reduced to four days. So, if you, especially if you're coming in with a heavy heat load to start with, that will reduce it even more. They come in at 90 degrees Fahrenheit. You're with cooling them at room temperature, which is probably 70 degrees. Uh, you're not looking at a very long time before you start to see leakage and possibly mold development. So if you need to move your grapes quickly at a, for a farmer's market or whatever, plan to do so. And then the other thing that a lot of people forget, um, it's better to do this well ahead of time, like in the winter. Think about your refrigeration capacity needs for the next following summer, because most people never think about this until it's too late. You think you've got plenty of cooler space, then for whatever reason you added another crop or it came out at the wrong time or you had a rain event, and suddenly you have nowhere to go with one of your crops and you have to decide what to do. And the other problem is, of course, since you're going to close to freezing, your refrigeration capacity is going to be bigger. Your need is going to be bigger. So you have to make sure whatever you choose for your refrigeration system is capable of getting there and staying there. A refrigerator, for instance, is a pretty inefficient way to store grapes. Every time you open that door, all of the air inside is exchanged and it warms up and you have to cool it down again. One way around some of these problems with cold storage and expense is to use a cool bot system and, the, and this is basically the cool bot is a device that cools an AC unit, because in this case it's simply a room AC unit, into going underneath 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, these are useful they're not going to get you to freezing. They're not going to go to 32 Fahrenheit. You can probably get about 36 degrees Fahrenheit effectively. Um, but they do give you an option to do this yourself, number one. And number two, it's a quick fix. Yeah, you don't Because it's not mechanized refrigeration systems, you don't need to be an expert to fix it if something goes wrong. And then I just will leave you with these sources of post-harvest information. These are free. USDA Handbook 66, UC Davis Produce Fact Sheets and also USDA grading standards for muscadine. In particular, this last one down here, the unofficial visual aid and the market inspection guide. These are useful to follow. If you don't know much about muscadines, you want to make sure that you're presenting the right material to people. And with that, 